So, did I get you? Well, maybe not. You probably know me well enough by now to have seen that one coming. But if I was able to get you even a little bit, then pay attention to your pulse and breathing rate. It just shot up a bit, didn't it? This is due to a sudden surge in your sympathetic nervous system, and we're going to spend the next several minutes looking at the different pathways this surge takes as it courses through the body. In doing so, we're going to rely quite heavily on the diagram that you see in front of you, so you might as well take a few minutes to orient yourself. It shows the central nervous system, the sympathetic chains connected through the gray rami communicants, and the various routes to all of the effector organs that the sympathetic nervous system acts upon. Note that in this diagram, the red lines represent presynaptic axons, while the black represents postsynaptic axons. Now, despite the diverse paths taken by the sympathetic nerve branches, they all begin in the same fashion. Presynaptic axons project from the cell bodies in the lateral horn of the spinal cord, enter the spinal nerve, then project into the sympathetic chain through the white rami communicants, located between T1 through L2. From here, the paths diverge. Now, let's look at the simplest situation first. This involves the axons immediately synapsing on the postganglionic cell bodies at the same vertebral level. The postganglionic axons then exit through the gray rami communicants to re-enter the same spinal nerve and continue on to the effector organs. This is the situation that is typically seen in the skin and musculature of the body walls and appendages. It's responsible for opening capillary beds to muscle tissue to supply more oxygen and carry away lactic acid, as well as to the skin and sweat glands to eliminate metabolic heat through evaporative cooling. The second pathway is slightly more complex. It involves presynaptic axons moving up and down in the sympathetic chain prior to synapsing and accounts for the interconnections between the sympathetic ganglia. Although this happens at all points along the sympathetic chain, it is of particular importance in the head and neck region. Remember, the highest cord level that the sympathetic axons exit from is T1. For sympathetic fibers supplying structures in the head, the sympathetic chain projects superiorly past the uppermost rami communicants just posterior to the left and right carotid artery. In this region, three distinct ganglia are identified. The most prominent of these ganglia is the superior cervical ganglia. It contains the cell bodies of all the postsynaptic neurons that follow the internal carotid artery into the head. In addition to the skin, there are a few distinct structures in the head and neck region that receive sympathetic innervation. Sympathetic fibers course with the lingual nerve to reach the submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. Sympathetic stimulation serves to decrease salivation, which results in a drier mouth during periods of sympathetic stimulation. Similar fibers merge with the auriculotemporal nerve to supply sympathetic innervation to decrease secretions from the parotid gland. Other sympathetic fibers course with the internal carotid artery to enter the cranial vault as the internal carotid plexus. Along this route, a number of sympathetic fibers project from the plexus in the foramen lacerum as the deep petrosal nerve, merging with the greater petrosal nerve to enter the pterygopalatine canal as the vidian nerve. From here, the nerve branches extensively to supply the mucosal membrane of the oral and nasal cavity. Another portion of this nerve enters the orbit of the eye through the maxillary nerve. It then projects along the lateral wall of the orbit to reach the lacrimal gland of the eye. Sympathetic innervation of the lacrimal gland decreases its activity, resulting in decreases in tear production. Finally, a number of fibers pass through the superior orbital fissure and join the short ciliary nerves to project to the eyeball. These fibers stimulate the longitudinal muscles of the iris, which contract to dilate the pupil. Damage to the sympathetic chain at the level of the superior cervical ganglia will lead to a loss in sympathetic innervation to the affected side of the face, a condition known as Horner syndrome. Because of the chain's proximity to the carotid arteries, surgical removal of plaque deposits from the carotid arteries, a procedure known as a carotid antarterectomy, can often result in this condition.
The most distinct symptom of Horner syndrome is a chronically constricted pupil on the affected side due to a loss of innervation to the longitudinal muscles of the iris. The patient may also experience pale, dry skin on the affected side and increased rates of salivation, but these symptoms are much more subtle. In addition to its supply to structures in the head and neck, branches from the superior cervical ganglion join fibers from the middle and inferior cervical, as well as upper thoracic ganglia, to project to the organs of the thorax. This may seem a little strange at first, but remember that early in embryology, the heart first develops in the neck region and later descends, taking its nerve supply with it. Many of these fibers pass either anterior or posterior to the arch of the aorta, where they join with parasympathetic branches of the vagus nerve to form the superficial and deep cardiac plexuses, respectively. They will then pass into the heart and synapse on the cardiomyocytes. In the case of the sympathetic nervous system, this synapse serves to increase contractile rate and force. Similarly, a collection of sympathetics pass either in front of or behind the trachea to fuse with fibers from the vagus nerve and form the anterior and posterior divisions of the pulmonary plexus. These fibers continue along the bronchi to supply the bronchial tree and visceral pleura. So, we discuss these cardiac and pulmonary plexuses in the thorax, but what do they actually look like in the body? Well, like an indiscriminate collection of strings, really. It's not like the brachial plexus where we could identify distinct roots and trunks, for example. The branching here is much more extensive, and so consequently, it's impossible to identify distinct and predictable patterns of nerve distribution. When you dissect this area, you just need to be aware that the stringy material we find surrounding the arch of the aorta and the bronchi are actually important nerve branches containing postganglionic sympathetic free nerve endings. This leaves us with one final path to consider for the sympathetic nervous system. Rather than synapse in the sympathetic chain, a collection of presynaptic axons exit the sympathetic chain anteriorly. And this is the route that is taken by the sympathetic innervation to the abdominal pelvic organs. The collection of nerves that the sympathetics pass through are collectively known as the splanchnic nerves. We can further subdivide the splanchnic into greater, lesser, and least splanchnic nerves. While the greater splanchnic nerves are fairly apparent in the thoracic cavity, the lesser and least splanchnic nerves are much more difficult to identify. In the abdomen itself, the splanchnic nerves converge onto three separate locations that coincide with three unpaired vessels of the abdominal aorta. The greater splanchnic nerves primarily converge on a collection of ganglia surrounding the celiac trunk, where they synapse on postsynaptic cell bodies. Not surprisingly, then, we refer to these as the celiac ganglion. Postsynaptic axons exit the celiac ganglion and join with fibers from the vagus nerve to form the celiac and gastric neural plexuses surrounding the major arteries off the celiac trunk. They continue along these roots, supplying the organs and alimentary canal of the foregut region. The lesser splanchnic nerves primarily converge on ganglia surrounding the superior mesenteric artery. From here, a plexus of nerves is once again formed from postsynaptic sympathetic fibers and presynaptic parasympathetic fibers of the vagus nerve, which courses along the branches of the superior mesenteric artery to bring both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation to the midgut. In addition to the superior mesenteric ganglion, presynaptic fibers may also converge on the aorticorenal ganglion. In this case, postganglionic fibers travel to the kidneys and some of the upper pelvic organs. As we saw in the thorax, these nerve plexuses are not very distinct. If you were part of the group that dissected out any of the mesenteries, you probably noticed a collection of stringy material that was interspersed with the arteries you were asked to identify. These were the nerve plexuses formed by the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. The least splanchnic nerves generally converge on the ganglia surrounding the inferior mesenteric artery. Postsynaptic fibers continue on to supply the hindgut region, along with preganglionic parasympathetic fibers from the parasympathetic nervous system. 
Again, these fibers also converge on aorticorenal ganglia with postsynaptic fibers supplying the kidneys and pelvic organs. Also note the presence of the lumbar splanchnic nerves that branch from the portion of the chain that projects inferior to the lowermost white rami communicans located at L2. As with the cervical ganglia, presynaptic axons project inferiorly through the sympathetic chain. Postsynaptic fibers then project out to synapse primarily on the pelvic organs. Finally, there is one special case that needs to be addressed. A portion of the greater splanchnic nerve we just identified enters the ciliac ganglion but never actually synapses here. Instead, the presynaptic fibers once again leave the ciliac ganglion and follow the suprarenal arteries to enter the renal medulla. Rather than synapse directly on postsynaptic cell bodies, they stimulate chromaffin cells, which release epinephrine and norepinephrine directly into the bloodstream. This ensures a global response of the body to sympathetic stimulation. It's also the one spot in the body where preganglionic sympathetic axons do not synapse on postganglionic sympathetic cell bodies. We're just about ready to wrap up this discussion of the sympathetic nervous system, but before we finish, we should make mention of general visceral afferent fibers. And these are the sensory nerve cells that carry general sensation from the internal organs of the body to the central nervous system. We mention them here because they take a nearly identical path to those taken by the sympathetic fibers, although conduction is obviously in the opposite direction. The dendrites associated with the glands and smooth muscle of the abdomen will follow the nerve tracks back to the prevertebral ganglia found surrounding the three unpaired blood vessels. They will then pass into the splanchnic nerves to enter the sympathetic trunk, then course through the white rami communicans to enter the spinal nerves. Now here's where the paths diverge. As these are sensory fibers, they will join the general somatic afferents returning from the body walls and enter the spinal cord through the dorsal roots. Crosstalk between the poorly localized visceral afferents and somatic afferents results in a misinterpretation by the central nervous system of visceral pain originating from the body walls. This is the phenomenon we know as referred pain. That's going to do it for the sympathetic nervous system. In the final segment of this video podcast, we finish our discussion of the autonomic nervous system with a look at the parasympathetic nervous system. See you then.